Old Yeller, day three. That little Arliss, if he wasn't a mess. From the time he'd grown up big enough to get out of the cabin, he'd made a practice of trying to catch and keep every living thing that ran, flew, jumped, or crawled. Every night before Mama let him go to bed, she'd make Arliss empty his pockets of whatever he'd captured during the day. Generally, it would be a tangled up mess of grasshoppers and worms and praying bugs and little rusty tree lizards. One time, he brought in a horned toad that got so mad he swelled out round and flat as a Mexican tortilla and bled at the eyes. Sometimes it was st <clears throat> stuff like a young bird that had fallen out of its nest before it could fly, or a green speckled spring frog, or a striped water snake. And once he turned out of his pocket a wadded up baby copperhead that nearly threw Mama into spasms. We never did figure out why the snake hadn't bitten him, but Mama took no more chances on snakes. She switched Arliss hard for catching that snake. Then she made me spend better than a week taking him out and teaching him to throw rocks and kill snakes. That was all right with little Arliss. If Mama wanted him to kill snakes first, he'd kill them. But that still didn't keep him from sticking them in his pockets along with everything else he'd captured that day. The snakes might be stinking by the time Mama called on him to empty his pockets, but they'd be dead. Then, after the yellow dog came, little Arliss started catching even bigger game, like cottontail rabbits and sharple birds and a baby possum that s sulked and lay like dead for the first several hours until he finally f decided that Arliss wasn't going to hurt him. Of course, it was old Yeller that was doing the catching. He'd run the game down and turn it over to little Arliss. Then little Arliss could come in and tell Mama a big fib about how he caught it himself. I watched them one day when they caught a blue catfish out of Birdsong Creek. The fish had fed out into water so shallow that his top fin was sticking out. About the time I saw it, Old Yeller and Little Arliss did too. They made a run at it. The fish went scooting away toward deeper water. Only Yeller was too fast for him. He pounced on the fish and shut his big mouth down over it and went romping into the bank where he dropped it onto the grass and let it flop. And here came Little Arliss to fall on it like I guess he'd, be, he'd been doing everything else. The minute he got his hands on it, the fish finned him, and he went to crying. But he wouldn't turn the fish loose. He just grabbed it up and went running and squalling toward the house where he gave the fish to Mama. His hands were all bloody by then, where the fish had finned him. They swelled up and got mighty sore. Not even a mesquite thorn hurts as bad as a sharp fish fin when it's run deep into your hand. But as soon as Mama had wrapped his hands in a poultice of mashed up prickly pear root to draw out the poison, little Arliss forgot all about his hurt. And that night we ate the fish for supper. He told the biggest windy I ever heard about how he dived way down into a deep hole under the rocks and dragged that fish out and nearly got drowned before he could swim to the bank with it. But when I tried to tell Mama what really happened, she wouldn't let me. Now this is Arliss's story, she said. You let him tell it the way he wants to. I told Mama then, I said, Mama, that old yellow dog is going to make the biggest liar in Texas out of little Arliss. But Mama just laughed at me, like she always laughed at little Arliss's big windies after she'd gotten off where he couldn't hear her. She said for me to let little Arliss alone. She said that if he ever told a bigger whopper than the ones I used to tell, she had yet to hear it. Well, I hushed then. If Mama wanted little Arliss to grow up to be the biggest liar in Texas, I guess it wasn't any of my business. All of which I figure is what led up to little Arliss's catching the bear. I think Mama had let him tell so many big yarns about his catching live game that he'd begun to believe them himself. When it happened, I was down the creek, away splitting rails to fix up the yard fence where the bulls had torn it down. I'd been down there since dinner, working in a stand of tall, slim post oaks. I chopped down a tree, trim off the branches as far as I wanted, then cut it way up the rest of the top. After that, I'd start splitting the log. I'd split the log by driving steel wedges into the wood. I'd start at the big end and hammer in a wedge with the backside of my axe. This would start a little split running lengthways of the log. Then I'd take a second wedge and drive into it this split. This would split the log further along and at the same time loosen the first wedge. I'd then knock the first wedge loose and move it up into front of the second one. Driving one wedge ahead of the other like that I could finally split a log in two halves. Then I'd go to work on the halves, splitting them apart. That way, from each log, I'd come out with four rails. Swinging that chopping axe was sure hard work. The sweat poured off me. My back muscles ached. The axe got so heavy I could hardly swing it. My breath got harder and harder to breathe. An hour before sundown, I was worn down to a nub. It seemed like I couldn't hit another lick. Papa could have lasted till past sundown, but I didn't see how I could. I should shouldered my axe and started toward the cabin, trying to think up some excuse to tell Mama to keep her from knowing I was played clear out. That's when I heard little Arliss's scream. Well, little Arliss was a screamer by nature. He'd scream when he was happy and scream when he was mad, and a lot of times he'd scream just to hear himself make a noise. Generally, we'd pay no more mind to his screaming than we did to the gobble of a wild turkey. But this time was different. The second I heard this screaming, I felt my heart flop near over, clear over. This time, I knew little Arliss was in real trouble. I tore out 
up the trail leading toward the cabin. A minute before I'd been so tired with my rail splitting that I could, couldn't have struck a trot. But now I raced through the tall trees in that creek bottom, covering ground like a scared wolf. Little Arliss's second scream, when it came, was louder and shriller and more frantic sounding than the first. Mixed with it was a whimpering cry sound that I knew didn't come from him. It was a sound I'd heard before and seemed like I ought to know what it was, but right then I couldn't place it. Then from far off to one side came a sound that I would have recognized anywhere. It was the coughing roar of a charging bear. I just heard it once in my life. That was the time Mama had shot and wounded a hog-killing bear, and Papa had to finish it off with a knife to keep it from getting her. My heart went to pushing up into my throat, nearly choking off my wind. I strained for every lick of speed I could get out of my running legs. I didn't know what sort of little fix Arliss had got himself into, but I knew that it had to do with a mad bear, which was enough. The way the late... Late sun slanted through the trees, had the trail all cross banded with streaks of bright light and dark shade. I ran through these bright and dark patches so fast that the changing light nearly blinded me. Then suddenly I raced out into the open where I could see ahead, and what I saw sent a chill clear through to, my, to the marrow, marrow of my bones. There was little Arliss down in that spring hole again. He was lying half in and half out of the water, holding on to the hind leg of a little black bear cub no bigger than, bigger than a small coon. The bear cub was out of out on the bank, whimpering and crying and clawing the rocks with all three of his other feet, trying to pull away. But little Arliss was holding on for all he was worth, scared now and screaming his head off, too scared to let go. How the bear cub ever came to came to prowl close enough for little Arliss to grab him, I don't know. And why he didn't turn on him and bite loose, I couldn't figure out either. Unless he was like little Arliss, too scared to think. But all of that didn't matter now. What mattered was the bear cub's mama. She'd heard the cries of her baby and was coming to save him. She was coming so fast that she had the brush popping and breaking as she crashed through and over it. I could see her black, heavy figure piling off down the slant on the far side of the Birdsong Creek. She was roaring mad and ready to kill. And worst of all, I could see that I'd never get there in time. Mama couldn't either. She'd heard Arliss too, and here she came from the cabin, running down the slant toward the spring, screaming at Arliss, telling him to turn the bear cub loose. But little Arliss wouldn't do it. All he'd do was hang with that hind leg and let out one shrill shriek after another as fast as he could suck in a breath. Now the bear, now the she bear was charging across the shallows in the creek. She was knocking sheets of water high in the bright sun, charging with her fur up and her long teeth bared, filling the canyon with that awful coughing roar. And no matter how fast Mama ran or how fast I ran, the she bear was going to get there first. I think I nearly went went blind then, picturing what was going to happen to little Arliss. I know that I opened my mouth to scream, and not any sound came out. Then, just as the bear went lunging up the creek bank toward little Arliss and her cub, a flash of yellow came streaking out of the brush. It was that big yellow dog. He was roaring like a mad bull. He wasn't one-third as big and heavy as the she-bear, but when he piled into her from one side, he rolled her clear off her feet. <clears throat> they went down in a wild, roaring tangle of twisting bodies and scrambling feet and slashing fangs. As I raced past them, I saw the bear lunge up to stand on her hind feet like a man while she clawed at the body of the yellow dog, hanging to her throat. I didn't wait to see more. Without ever checking my stride, I ran in and jerked little Arliss loose from the cub. I grabbed him by the wrist and yanked him up out of that water and slung him toward Mama like he was a half-empty sack of corn. I screamed at Mama, Grab him, Mama. Grab him and run. Then I swung my chopping axe high and wheeled, aiming to cave in the, the she-bear's head with the first lick. But I never did strike. I didn't need to. Old Yeller hadn't let the bear get loose. He couldn't handle her. She was too big and strong for that. She'd stand there on her hide feet, hunched over, and take a roaring swing at him with one of those big front claws. She'd slap him head over heels. She'd knock him so far that it didn't look like he could possibly get back there before she charged again, but he always did. He'd hit the ground rolling, yelling his head off with the pain of the blow, but somehow he'd always roll to his feet, and here he'd come again, ready to tie into her for another round. I stood there with my axe raised, watching them for a long moment. Then from up toward the house, I heard Mama calling. Come away from there, Travis. Hurry, son. Run. That spooked me. Up until then, <clears throat> I'd been ready to tie into that bear myself. Now suddenly, I was scared out of my wits again. I ran toward the cabin. But like it was, Old Yeller nearly beat me there. I didn't see it, of course, but Mama said that minute the Old Yeller saw we were all in the clear and out of danger, he threw the fight to that she-bear and led out for the house. The bear chased him for a little piece, but at the rate Old Yeller was leaving her behind, Mama said it looked like the bear was backing up. But if the big yellow dog was scared or hurt in any way when he came dashing into the house, he didn't show it. He sure didn't show it like we all like we all did. Little Arliss had hushed his screaming, but he was trembling all over and clinging to Mama like he'd never let go. And Mama was sitting in the middle of the floor, holding him up close and crying like she'd never stop. And me, I was so I was close to crying myself. 
Old Yeller, though, all he did was come bounding in to jump on us and lick us in the face and bark so loud there inside the cabin, the noise nearly made us deaf. The way he acted, you might have thought that bear, hadn't, bear fight hadn't been anything more than a rowdy romp that we'd all taken part in for the fun of it. So little Arliss got mixed up in that bear fight. I guess I'd been looking on him about like most boys look on their little brothers. I liked him all right, but I didn't have a lot of use for him. <clears throat> what with his always playing in our drinking water and getting in the way of my chopping axe and howling his head off and chunking me with rocks when he got mad, it didn't seem to me like he was hardly worth the bother of putting up with. But that day when I saw him in the spring, so helpless against the angry she-bear, I learned different. I knew that then that I loved him as much as I did Mama and Papa, maybe in some ways even a little bit more. So it was only natural for me to come to love the dog that saved him. After that, I couldn't do enough for Old Yeller. What if he was a big, ugly, meat-stealing rascal? What if he did fall over and yell bloody murder every time I looked crossways at him? What if he had run off when he ought to have helped with the fighting bulls? None of that made a lick of difference now. He'd pitched in and saved little Arliss when I couldn't possibly have done it, and that was enough for me. I petted him and made over him like he was wiggling all over to show how happy he was. I felt mean about how I treated him and did everything I could to let him know. I searched his feet and pulled on long mesquite pulled out a long mesquite thorn that had become embedded between his toes i held him down and had mama hand me a stick with a coal of fire on it so i could burn off three big bloated ticks that had found that i found inside one of his ears i washed him with lye soap and water then rubbed salty bacon grease into his hair all over to rot the fleas and that night after dark when he was when he sneaked into bed with me and little arliss i let him sleep there and never said a word about it to mama I took him and little Arliss squirrel hunting the next day. It was the first time I'd ever taken little Arliss on any kind of hunt. He was such a noisy pest that I always figured he'd scared off the game. As it turned out, he was just as noisy and pesky as I'd figured. He'd follow along, keeping quiet like I told him, till he saw maybe a pretty butterfly floating around in the air. Then he'd set up a yell you could have heard a mile off and go chasing after the butterfly. Of course he couldn't catch it, but he would keep yelling at me to come help him. Then he'd get mad because I wouldn't and yell still louder. Or maybe he'd stop to turn over a flat rock, then he'd stand yelling at me to come back and look at all the yellow ants and centipedes and crickets and stinging scorpions that went scurrying away, hunting new hiding places. Once he got hung up in some briars and yelled till I came back to get him out. Another time he fell down and struck his elbow on a rock and didn't say a word about it for several minutes until he saw blood seeping out of a cut on his arm. Then he stood and screamed like he was being burnt with a hot iron. With that much racket going on, I knew we'd scare all the game clear out of the country, which I guess we did, all but the squirrels. They took to the trees where they could hide, and fr hide from us, but I was lucky enough to see which tree one squirrel went up, so I put, up, put some of little Arliss's racket to use. I sent him in a circle around the tree, beating on the grass and bushes with a stick while I stood waiting. Sure enough, the squirrel got, wa got to watching little Arliss and forgot me. He kept turning around the tree limb to keep it between him and the little Arliss till he was on my side in plain sight. I shot him out of the tree the first shot. After that, old Yeller caught on to what game we were after. He went to work there, there then trailing and treeing the squirrels that little Arliss was scaring up off the ground. From then on, with Yeller to tree the squirrels and little Arliss to turn them on the tree limbs, we had pickings. Wasn't a, but a little bit till I shot five, more than enough to make us a good squirrel fry for supper. A week later... Old Yeller helped me catch a wild gobbler that I'd, I'd have lost without him. We did, we had gone to the corn patch and picked the black-eyed peas. I was packing my gun. Just as we got to the slab, slab rock fence that Papa had built around the corn patch, I looked over and spotted this gobbler doing our pea picking for us. The pea pods were still green yet, most of them no further along than snapping size. This made them hard for the gobbler to shell, but he was working away at it, pecking and scratching so hard that he was raising a big dust out in the field. Why, that old rascal, Mama said. He's just clawing those pea vines all to pieces. Hush, Mama, I said. Don't scare him. I lifted my gun and laid the barrel across the top rock fence. I'll have him ready for the pot in just a minute. It wasn't a long shot, and I had him sighted in, dead to rights. I aimed to stick a bullet right where he, his wings hinged to his back. I was holding my breath and already squeezing off when little Arliss, who'd gotten behind, came running up. What you shooting at, Travis? He yelled at the top of his, top of his voice. What you shooting at? Well, that made me and the gobbler both jump. The gun fired, and I saw the gobbler go down. But a second later, he was up again, streaking through the tall corn, dragging a broken wing. For a second, I was so mad at little Arliss, I could have wrung his, his neck like a frying, frying chickens. I said, Arliss, why can't you keep your mouth shut? You've made me lose that gobbler. Well, little Arliss didn't have sense to, enough to know that what I was mad about. Right away, he puckered up 
and went to crying and leaking tears all over the place. Some of them splattered clear down on his bare feet, making dark splotches in the dust that covered them. I always did say that when little Arliss cried, he could have shed more tears faster than any crier I ever saw. Wait a minute, Mama put in. I don't think you've lost your gobbler yet. Look yonder. She pointed and I looked, and there was old Yeller jumping the rock fence and racing toward the pea patch. He ran up to where I knocked the gobbler down. He circled the place one time, smelling the ground, and wiggled his stub tail. Then he took off through the corn the same way the gobbler went, yelling like I was beating him with a stick. When he barked, treed, a couple minutes later, it was in the woods on the other side of the corn patch. We went to him. We found him jumping at the gobbler that had run up a stooping live oak and was perched there, panting, just waiting for me. So in spite of the fact that little Arliss had caused me to make a bad shot, we had us a real sumptuous sup supper that night. Roast turkey with cornbread dressings and watercress and wild onions that little Arliss and I had found growing down in the creek next to the water. But when we tried to feed old Yeller some of the turkey on account of his saving us from losing it, he wouldn't eat it. He wouldn't eat. He licked the meat and wiggled his stub tail to show how grateful he was, but he didn't swallow down more than a bite or two. That puzzled Mama and me because when we remembered back, he, we realized that he hadn't been eating anything we'd fed him for the last several days. Yet he was fat with his hair as slick and shiny as a dog eating three square me meals a day. Mama shook her head. If I didn't know better, she said, I'd say that dog was sucking eggs. But I've got three hens setting and one with bitty chickens. And I'm getting more eggs from the rest of them than I've gotten since last fall. So he can't be robbing the nests. Well, we wondered some about what old Yeller was living on, but didn't worry about it. That is, not until the day Bud Searcy dropped by the cabin to see how we were making out.